Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Last Call podcast, the podcast companion for my weekly Star Wars column, That Cantina. I am your host, Kyle Malone, and today I'm actually joined by uh, a special guest, as well as my co-host for the Last Call pro- podcast, uh, Cam Clark. So, uh, Cam, how's it going, buddy? Yeah, not too bad, not too bad. How are you? I'm doing all right, man. Uh, not sure if excited is the word to use to discuss this movie, but uh, Probably yeah, not, we'll get to that. It's a process. <laughs> we, have, we have to go through the process. <laughs> exactly. And uh, some of you that have watched uh, LRM Ranks It, and thank you for watching that, will remember the LRM Ranks It Christmas Movies episode and one of my nearest and dearest friends, Brian Brantley. He's come back to the uh, LRM fold uh, one more time to help us out with this podcast brian how's it going bud it's going good real good so cool <laughs> how, 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 how are you feeling after the the horrible um event that has led to this podcast <laughs> <laughs> and I, i'm coming fresh off it i just it was the last piece of media i consumed i, mm. I watched it last night same here i same here. just finished it today so <laughs> <laughs> i'm uh, so fresh it's unbelievable yeah, yeah. So uh, most of you guys should know just by, uh, you know, logic and thinking about what comes after the fandom is that today we are talking about Star Wars Episode 2, Attack of the Clones. Um, it's a very interesting movie, not necessarily because it's good, <laughs> but it does it does have a lot of uh, different feelings uh, amongst it. I know that, Brian, you're actually pretty, as far as prequel movies go, you're a pretty big fan of Attack of the Clones, right? uh compared to the other two uh yeah yes yeah just the prequels nothing nothing else yeah, yes, <laughs> yes. and uh cam i think you said you were kind of neutral on it it's got moments but it's not like your most hated it's not like your most loved well it's my second least favorite star wars film i think we should probably yeah. point that out um however there are i th- you know, as we probably get into this later, but I think it really there's a good movie they are trying to get out, and mm-hmm. it just is not allowed mm-hmm. to get out at all. And there are some moments in it which I believe are are actually quite good, um, but mixed in with other things makes the overall movie quite bad, in my opinion. Yeah, definitely. Um, well. Before we jump into it, you know, it's a business and we got to do those business things. So we got to ask you guys, please make sure you hit that subscribe button. Excuse me. Make sure you hit that subscribe button here on the Los Fanboys podcast channel. Uh, it's available wherever you get your your podcasts, uh, including stuff like SoundCloud and, and iTunes. Um, make sure you hit subscribe. Make sure you share us with your friends and family on social media. Uh, share the love, guys. Share the love. LRM uh, we we love doing this stuff for you guys, and uh, we we want to reach as many ears as we possibly can. Uh, so yeah, hit that hit that subscribe button, and uh, let's go ahead and get into. Uh, I want I want to know about your guys' memories when this movie first came out. After you'd seen the Phantom Menace, you know what what was it like when the attack when Attack of the Clones was uh, first announced? Brian, uh, going into seeing that movie, how did you feel before you actually saw it? Before I saw it, I, you know, I it wasn't. I was actually excited. Um, this film lined up with my graduating of high school. Like mm-hmm. within the course of two weeks, I turned eighteen. I graduated high school, and Attack of the Clones came out. Mm-hmm. So, so going into it, you know, I, I was actually quite excited um, to see it. Okay, and, and I uh, felt that oh, it had sorry, the potential ahead. to. It, I felt it had the potential to redeem some of the issues i had with the phantom menace you know i'm like we got an older anakin Mm -hmm. this is what i want Mm -hmm. very cool uh cam what did you think uh coming off of the phantom menace seeing that you know what little trailers and stuff we had seen for attack of the clones what were your thoughts going into it i I think i probably echo brian and i had great confidence um and hope going into attack of the clones i knew that the phantom menace had many issues but at the time i as I said on the Phantom Menace podcast, I probably glossed over a lot of them and, and convinced myself they weren't as bad as what I, th- I, th- I thought they were. Mm-hmm. And I thought, well, Attack of the Clones, it's the second one, you know, this will be the one that ignites the story, you yeah. know. And 
we've got an older Anakin, we're going to really start getting into the meat of what this story is now, and it's going to be a hell of a lot better. It's going to redeem the Phantom Menace. That that was that was my thoughts going in, or my hope, shall I say. <laughs> Uh, I'm as same as you guys, you know, I had to convince myself that I, I liked the Phantom Menace. Um, Brian, you're, uh, just a, about a year older than myself and, and Cam is ancient, but that's neither here or there. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> but no, um, Cam, you were definitely much older than me and Brian were when we yeah. saw the Phantom Menace. So I mean, it probably I... took a lot more work for you to convince yourself that it was good than me and Brian, Brian. Just a quick touch on the Phantom Menace. Did did you have to convince yourself that you liked it, or did you just accept that it sucked from the get go? I uh, sort of had to convince myself that I liked it early on. It, 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 it was funny because I remember I saw it several times, not as many as you, but uh, I yeah. did see it several times in theaters, and um, I, I just kept saying, "Well, Darth Maul was cool," you know. That's <laughs> well. Um, Getting into Attack of the Clones, you know, we all obviously saw the movie when it when it did originally come out. What were your feelings of it initially after seeing it in theaters? Uh, go with Cam. Okay, so I probably did enjoy it better than The Phantom Menace. So because I was in this self-denial period um, to do with Star Wars at the time, I would say I was probably quite pumped after it. Uh, and the good moments washed over me more than the bad ones did uh, and I just kind of, I don't know put, pushed them to one side uh, and embraced it um, would probably be the, the, the best thing I actually watched it quite a lot and, and enjoyed it at the time but as this, as the series went on and, and my own sort of taste matured and yeah I was older, I was I was in my 20s by the time Attack of the Clones came out, 2002 I was born in the ripe old years of 1970 so yeah I was about what 24 uh, when it came out mm-hmm. so yeah I, I probably did enjoy it but repeated viewings changed my mind yeah definitely uh Brian same thing yeah um when, when I first saw this film I I liked it mm-hmm. I, I liked it a lot and um I saw it multiple times in theaters. It, it was after repeated viewings. I mean, last night especially, um, that I really was able to look at it and say, "It's the dialogue." I mean, God, um, the dialogue does not hold up mm-hmm. at all. No, no. definitely. Um, I, I actually, when I when I first saw it. It was kind of cool. I got to see all of these prequel movies with my dad in theaters, and that was that was pretty you know special moment. Um, I was definitely uh, not born when the originals came out, and uh, my dad's job in the military at the time really didn't provide him uh, opportunities to go see a lot of movies uh, with me. So I ended up seeing the uh, special edition of the OT uh, pretty much all by myself. I think I went to a couple of them with some friends from school, but. Um, it was nice to go see it with my dad, and I remember he enjoyed it, and we both kind of enjoyed what we saw. We thought the the scene with all the Jedi at the Coliseum on Geosis was great, and um, we were pleased with, you know, at the time, the graphics. But yeah, uh, repeat viewings and, and looking at it today, it just it doesn't hold up. And like Brian said, the, the dialogue's just atrocious. Uh, yeah. Very similar to The Phantom Menace. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's I mean we're all kind of on on board and kind of the same uh, when it comes to these feelings and memories. Um, how many times did you see it in theaters, Brian? Episode two. I think four. I think wow. four. Yeah. Cam, how many times did you see it? Uh, yeah, probably the same. Right about mm-hmm. four. Um, I more I watched it more once I could get it on home release. Um, mm-hmm. I definitely watched it far more times myself, but uh, probably about four times in theaters in total, which is it's still far more than I see the average film. Yeah, uh, I have to say, but um, not quite as many times as perhaps Phantom Menace, which was maybe about five times in total in, in, in the <laughs> cinema. But <laughs> it, you know, it starts going down from this point on. So yeah. Definitely. And I, I know I saw it uh, two times, but I have a memory of seeing it a third time. I really do think I saw it a third time. Um, so let's go ahead and get uh, into the movie itself. And uh, I'm switching pages here on my notes. Um, 
one of the you know the movie opens up with a uh, convoy of uh, Nubian or Nabooian. I don't remember Nubian. Yeah, Nubian Nubian, uh, Nubian ships, including another mirror finished silver B two bomber looking thing or B one bomber looking thing, um, the flying wing, and uh, they they get up. Uh, on to Coruscant, you know, Coruscant's where we're coming in at. And the first thing I noticed watching this, I've, I'm actually watching the Blu-ray versions of these movies for the first time. Um, I have not seen uh, any Blu-ray version of these movies until I'm watching them for this podcast. Uh, I'm one of those people that has the uh, DVD of the original trilogy that actually had the unaltered theatrical releases. And that's what I watch for the OT. And I had regular DVDs of the prequel trilogies that I bought when they, you know, first came out. But I never bought the Blu-rays because it just all the changes Lucas made, I didn't want to see them. And so this was actually the first time seeing it on Blu-ray, seeing it on an HD TV. And dear God, does it look crappy? Did, <laughs> did you guys notice that? Like coming into Coruscant the, with the clothes, crappy. yes, yeah. and the, yes, the building sticking out. Yes, yeah, doesn't look good. And absolute then, crap. I hate that design yep. of the ship, the, the B2 bomber type design as well. It just, you know, really don't like that that look of ship, but I suppose small potatoes in the grand scheme of things, but yeah, it did look a little bit ropey. That, ex- you know, that explo- the explosion looks horrible. Oh, oh yeah. I mean, I, I wasn't sure if we were going to get to that yeah. bit yet, but <laughs> I, that is, I mean, it's like someone's popped a popper in the corner. <laughs> Poof, everybody fall over. Ugh, and then, you know, like, despite being in this large explosion it's like a cartoon explosion because because the the queen's uh, sort of handmaiden mm-hmm. all she gets is dusty with a little scratch on her you yeah. know it's because that's what happens in explosions you know um yeah kyle um, i'm sure you've seen that a lot in your military service you know uh where somebody's got a little bit of dust and they got them go oh i'm so sorry <laughs> and then and then keel over, you know. Give us an explosion. Just just blow up the ship. Blow it up. Have them all standing around and then talk afterwards. That would have been far more exciting. But no, I hate that explosion. Yeah, definitely. And what's really weird is, as soon as uh, it was Amidala or Padme, whatever you want to fucking call her, uh, but she oh, okay. and Captain Typho, Typho, Typho. Typho I think. Okay. Yep. Yep. Uh, that they both were the escort ships. Uh, so I'm wondering when mm. she learned to fly <laughs> first off, but they're wearing pilot gear and they, they walk over and he's all like, you know, I guess I was wrong. There was no threat at all. And she's still wearing her helmet. So it's very obvious that it's still her, uh, or that, that she's, that she's somebody special, not the the senator on the thing and the fact that they when we first see the senator and they're all like are you know who's supposed to be Amidala and they're like oh we're we're coming in to Coruscant all you see is from behind the head like their attempt at trying to elicit a surprise oh my god did they just kill the queen it didn't work do you know I, that I, would have probably been better wouldn't it see if they just killed her ever if they would have yeah. been like yes <laughs> Natalie Portman's character is no more we can carry on it didn't work. Uh, Brian, when, when you first saw the movie, uh, did, did did you get tricked? Did you think they actually killed the queen for a moment? Uh, no. I, I'm, I, no. <laughs> Not at all. Yeah, definitely. Uh, after that, you know, they, they carry on. They go to talk to um, – pretty much they go to talk to uh, Palpatine. It's like the, yeah. the next big thing that we get to. Um in Palpatine's office, one thing I noticed on this Blu-ray, on, and I'm not even watching a 1080p or 4K TV. My my office here in my house has a little 720 Hitachi TV. You know, it's it's like low end. It was cheap when I bought it, and that's why I bought it. But even even 720p with Blu-ray, uh, I can I can see literally the only thing that's real <laughs> is the furniture, like. Yeah, I honestly don't even remember if the carpet is real. But when in Palpatine's office, we 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 get our first look at at the all digital, you know, new stuff. Because even the Phantom Menace had some set pieces, yeah. and it looks like Attack of the Clones and Revenge of the Sith. There are no fucking set pieces. Yeah, Cam, well, go maybe ahead. Maybe a little. Um, the, definitely that this was at the point that you you noticed that they were going full digital with us going forward. Um. And while that does suit some scenes, um, despite, you know, the, the, the special effects are not as good as what we would get in a Marvel film today, but hey, you know, you, you can't begrudge them that too much. But 
yeah, things like that where there could be a real set and instead they just have most of it green screen and fill in the details. Really, the only part of that that should have been green screen are the windows yeah. at the back of the office because mm-hmm. you, can't, you can't have that in real life. Everything else should have been built as a set and it doesn't look as if it has been. It doesn't at all. Uh, Brian, what was your take on on that initial scene? You know, this is the first time we've seen Palpatine uh, since the Phantom Menace as, as Chancellor, and we're, we know something's up dealing with military and separatists. Uh, what what were your feelings on that scene? Because it's very politics heavy, yeah. like the Phantom Menace was. What, what were your feelings on it? Well, for the first time ever, I noticed the Red Guards in the doorway. I mm-hmm. never remember seeing them before, and I guess I was, you know, really paying attention this time. Oh, this viewing. Yeah, this viewing. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. I'd never know. I was like, oh, wow, there's <laughs> two red guards standing in the doorway just hanging out, uh, which I thought was interesting. And as far as the politics, oddly enough, that's probably my f- favorite stuff now in this film because <laughs> it's the only scenes where the dialogue, I mean, it's bad, but the actors believe in it, or at mm-hmm. least try to believe in it um, compared to stuff we'll talk about later. Uh, but yeah, no, um, I think the most bizarre thing is all the quick cuts, Mm. you know, this film goes through so many cuts so quickly uh, as scene, 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 scene. And, um, it, that initial scene, um, this scene, particularly if you watch the first like 10 minutes of the movie, it's just like scene, 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 you know, they're really trying to push the story, get them off world. Definitely. Um, one thing that I did notice in this, and I mentioned this cam in the Phantom Menace, and it's it's one of my biggest issues I have with the um, the sequel trilogy is I liked the use of existing aliens. Uh, the the hologram call that the that the Chancellor gets that Palpatine gets is from a, a Rodian. Mm-hmm. Uh, Rodian, I appreciated that. Um, we we hear on the on the way in the elevator we hear um, Anakin uh, mention Gundarks. And yep. that's a throwback to, you know, Empire Strikes Back. Empire. Han says, I bet you could, you know, rip the ears off a of gun dark. And I really appreciate that type of, uh, I don't want to call it homage, but that type of connective tissue. It's that's, it's those that's small world things. building. That, that yeah. You do that when you're world building. Yeah. Um, you want it to feel like a, a lived and breathed in universe. And, 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 and absolutely, in that respect, the prequels. Do actually, I think, do mm-hmm. a, a little bit of a better job than the sequel trilogy, which I know we've spoke about before. That it, it does feel like that universe. It's it's not that's not the problem with um, mm-hmm. the prequels. The the problem is the the, the pure quality itself. Yeah, uh, yeah, and I I did hate that Palpatine scene as well because I think although Ian McDermott is one of the best actors in the prequel trilogy, I thought that was his worst scene. It's like a pantomime villain, you know, <laughs> the way that. <laughs> He's influenced things and then making it so obvious that even yeah. a, a two-year-old can work out that this is really the Dark Lord. I said in The Phantom Menace, they should have held back his identity so that if you're watching it from from that being the start of the story, you don't know that this guy's the person that turns out to be the Emperor. It would only be us hardcore fans that knew Ian McDermott's name that would that mm-hmm. would understand that. And And they just do such a terrible job there that you think... How can the Jedi, I mean, despite the force, how can they not work out? You know, they should be looking at me and going, what are you smirking for? You know, what are you, you're smirking, mate. What's, what's going on? You know, I'm suspicious now. <laughs> it Definitely. doesn't make any sense to me. Definitely. Uh, Brian, why don't you go ahead and walk us through your, your take this time around watching this movie with our introduction to Anakin and uh, Ewan McGregor, uh, especially there in the elevator. It, it it's the beginning of awkwardness. Every Anakin or Hayden Christensen is so awkward in this film. In every scene, that particular scene, you could tell Obi Wan's really or you and McGregor. He's really trying. I, I really mm-hmm. he is trying in that in that especially in that scene. But they they don't have chemistry. No, you know what I mean. Like they don't have that. Hey, we've been hanging out for you know ten years or whatever and. It, they really don't. It, it I, this film could have used a little more prep time, and as far as maybe them hanging out, um, well, it needed a rewrite. Let's let's be honest. The script needed to be worked. Yeah, the, the, George Lucas went with the idea that he was going to have Obi Wan be this quite uh, judgmental teacher. 
Mm -hmm. and of this very much teacher-student relationship, and that was a mistake. That was absolutely a mistake. Uh, If anything, we should have felt that by the end of it, maybe if Obi-Wan had been harder on Anakin, this this might not have happened, but really you can't blame him because they were good pals, you know. When yeah. Obi-Wan talks about him, it's like they were friends. So, yeah, he's a little bit older, than, but there's really not a, a massive age gap between them. And at that point, if they also had made Anakin just a few years older, so he was actually more the age Obi-Wan was in The Phantom Menace. He's literally just ready to take the trials. He doesn't really need to be with his master anymore. He's not teaching him, you know, every step, do this, and I can do that, and I can, yes, master, no, master, of course, master. Yeah. I can say master a lot. It's the, my favorite <laughs> word is to say master. You know what I mean? <laughs> it's, oh, that, and, and that fundamentally then carries that relationship all the way through that film mm-hmm. so that when we get to the start of Revenge of the, the Sith, which I know we'll get to, and they're supposed to be kind of buddy-buddy at that point, it feels weird. It, it doesn't yeah. work because it feels weird. You haven't built up. You don't, you don't believe in the relationship between these two characters whatsoever. The time skip is is huge. Anakin mentions specifically that he hasn't seen Padme in 10 years. Yeah. And a 10-year skip is is a pretty big deal, especially when you're trying to, like you guys have said, you know, you're trying to build this relationship between uh, Anakin and Obi-Wan. Um, but we don't, we don't get to see anything that really – makes us believe it and considering how awful the dialogue is it makes it really hard to buy into the relationship at least for me um because the dialogue does suck the writing does suck and all we have to go off of is a couple of anecdotal stories that anakin and and obi-wan tell yeah oh yeah do you remember this happening or oh yeah do you remember that happening it's almost like there should have been a five-year time gap in the phantom menace itself and then another five years between phantom menace and this one well or, or, or something you know they should have made anakin older in the exact menace so yes. that you know yes they've, they've had that mental relationship but new anakin's grown up he's matured you know and they're, they're actually quite friendly now that you know in fact to the point where it shouldn't have been like the first time he had ever been on a mission in his own mm-hmm. uh, that kind of thing, it should have been, okay, look, you go this way, we go that way, don't worry about me, Master, you know, we've been apart loads of times before, we'll catch up in the middle and, and we're good to go. And I think, I think that would have been far more uh, exciting uh, and dramatic, um, uh, to, you know, between those characters to have that kind of energy, that mm-hmm. buzz between them. And it's just not there, as you said, Kyle, uh, you, the, uh, and Brian, the, the chemistry is just not there at all. And when Obi-Wan does his little like laugh, <laughs> like that, you know, <laughs> Ewan McGregor's a better actor than that. I mean, if immediately if that, I can't believe that a director has looked at that cut and said, "Yeah, print that." <laughs> you know, yeah. with that, you know, I would have been cracking jokes trying to go Obi Wan, Obi Wan, sorry, Ewan McGregor to laugh. I would have been doing something to just lighten the mood to get him. Mm-hmm. You know, into a place where that sounded genuine, but, natural. Yeah, but that's partly the dialogue as well. If it had actually been humorous and and banter type dialogue, then as an actor you can get into it more, I suppose. You know, whereas it's just I've got to do a fake laugh, so here it is, <laughs> and away you go. You know, it's uh, I want to say two things. Uh, one, I and I want both of you guys' opinion on this. Uh, despite s- stuff like what you just mentioned, Cam. Uh, I do think McGregor does a really decent job with his facial expressions and his body language. Did did you find that viewing this? Did did McGregor do a good job with that? Because I thought he did. Cam, um, yeah. I, again, he, he is trying. Mm-hmm. He is trying. You know, you can see that. And you know, I've I've wa- I'd watched Ewan McGregor in many films. You know, as a Scottish actor, uh, we obviously things like Shallow Grave, Train Spotting. He was great when they announced mm-hmm. him playing Obi Wan. I thought that is perfect. You know, because he is a really good actor, and I've mm-hmm. seen him. Um, and he has always good in everything that he's in, but. You, there's only so much you can do with the dialogue exactly. that he's given. He's, he's got to play Obi Wan is so straightforward. I wanted to see Obi Wan actually be a bit more loose and and be that that wise person. You know that um, Alec Guinness, who's you know just commands wisdom just by his very presence on screen. 
Um, but I wanted to see you and McGregor develop into that over the trilogy rather than try to play him like that at the start. I mean, I think in Empire he does say to Yoda, isn't it? Was I any different when you taught me? Yeah. You know? And I actually wanted to see that. You know, Obi Wan learn from Yoda throughout the trilogy about what it meant to be a really, really be a Jedi and that maybe it was the wrong choice to, to train Anakin in the first place. Interesting. Uh, Brian, what did you think of the body language and facial expressions? I I, it, I think the scenes where he was not with Hayden Christensen, <laughs> I agree. That's I true. Think, yeah, I, yeah it, I, especially like you will Camino and different stuff mm -hmm. like that. I, I actually quite like his performance. It, it is when he's with Hayden Christensen, like like we were saying earlier, they just did not have that chemistry. Um, and I don't know. I think he tried. I do think he tried, but the direction was just not there. He was not being guided properly. Um, so okay, and, and you know, speaking of dialogue, it's it's something that seems to be a running. Uh, a running theme even though we've only done this is only our second podcast uh the dialogue is something that was actually mentioned in the original star wars uh which later on became you know episode four new hope uh people even even um ford uh fisher and hamill had mentioned you know this dialogue is really weird it's it's hard to say these types of things that lucas had written but Yet when you look at taking Lucas away from the writing aspect, when you look at, you know, uh, five and six, your your dialogue, even though it's still inspired and, and fits that world, becomes a lot smoother. How much better, even if you even if you kept the exact same stories, how much better would these movies have been if they were written by someone else? Uh, oh, Brian. A lot. Um, the stories do have issues, but. To, it's the dialogue that, that, in my opinion, makes everything fall apart. I can forgive some of the story decisions, yeah, but the dialogue haunts you. I mean, it really does, and it and it makes certain scenes just. I laughed out loud a couple times last night. You know, I'm like, wow. You know, there, there's some dialogue. It's just that bad. So yes, this somebody else should have written these scripts, or at least um, he could have written the initial draft and had a you know a couple yeah rewrites. You know? Yeah, definitely, Cam. See, the thing is, I mean, going back to the old trilogy, I think A New Hope, the dialogue really isn't that bad. And I think Ford, Hamill, etc. were more talking about the kind of language that they were using yeah. that was made up, you know, and they couldn't understand, well, this is, you know, was it Ford says, you know, you can type this shit, George, but, you know, you can't say it. <laughs> um, and, uh, but I think that that's world building. You know, they're supposed to know these kind of things because they're in that world where people yeah. do just jump my ship in hyperspace. So that that's part of that believability. But, but he actually wrote some decent banter between um, Solo and Luke, you know, um, and the trash compactor, you know, the banter that Leia and, and Han had was still there in A New Hope. So it's really not that bad, but... It plummets unbelievably in, in the prequels, and I absolutely do agree that Lucas could have come up with a basic concept, but he needed someone else to then write the script and be willing to say, yeah, you can change if, if, it, fits, if it fits the drama. Yeah, I can see, you know, somebody that really pushed back on that type of thing. Um, and he did not have that. Yeah. Uh, bringing up Lucas himself, we, <laughs> we all know uh, there's a specific character that Lucas... Uh, created or helped create uh, that took a lot of flack in the Phantom Menace and you can see the results of all of that anger or disappointment or whatever emotion you want to you want to bring out uh, in Attack of the Clones by the lack of use of this character and that is Jar Jar Binks uh, who first off who in the fuck decided to have this dude as a representative for the Gungans <laughs> like seriously I know <laughs> You know, and then and then Padma says <clears throat> at one point, sorry, I'm getting husky. Um, and Padma does say at one point, you know, I trust you to represent Naboo while I'm gone. <laughs> what? Yeah. what? Why? <laughs> Why? You know, he'll he'll fall over and land in his face and shoot Poto or something <laughs> like that. It's, you just you don't do that. Saying people don't do that. You know, it's it's actually rips you out of the movie when they do something as stupid yeah. as that. You're like that. Why? A normal person doesn't do anything like this. Not some sort of senator from Naboo that's supposed to be experienced well, politically. It's yeah, because the the film goes out of its way 
for her to talk about how much she loves her world and how much she, you know, respects politics. Mm -hmm. And I mean, she, that's her whole character is, is being a leader and, you know, being there for her people. And yeah. And then that scene comes up and she's like, no, you, you, you can run it. I, I trust you. <laughs> and of course he's the one that, you know, votes like, wrong. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, because wrong. he's very easily manipulated. Very easily. Because he's an idiot. Exactly. And that's, that's, that's what I'm getting at. Like, who the fuck? Because she calls him Representative Jar Jar. So who the fuck on the Gungan side of it? Because even if you look at uh, the Phantom Menace. I have a head on this. I do have a head on this. I reckon the Gungans were so sick of him that they thought, <laughs> well, actually, we, we make him the representative. This guy's this guy's getting fucked off to Coruscant, Coros, you know. We, we ain't going to be putting up with his shit for a long time. Oh yes, yeah. Uh, oh, we have uh, we have selected representative Binks or something like that, you know. And away oh, it goes. But you know, they probably never thought that anybody would then be stupid enough to then listen to anything the guy said while he was in the Senate, you know. <laughs> Oh my God, Cam, I've never in my life looked at it like that. <laughs> Brian, a hot take on that? Yeah, I mean, I I don't, yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. God. Um, one thing I've always, always wondered though, Lucas, uh, who may or may not be the namesake of my own child, <laughs> <laughs> Anybody that knows me, my my son's name is Lucas. Anybody that knows me knows exactly where his name comes from. Um, it, it's I I always wonder how does George Lucas feel about the reaction to Jar Jar Binks because he how does he, how does he sleep at night? Him, <laughs> he obviously intended him to be a big part of the prequel trilogy, but people fucking hated him and i'm not even getting into the the stereotypical and and racist aspects of it just just the character itself and just its interactions with with other characters in the world was just atrocious and then yeah definitely you excuse me you add on the layer of a st uh, stereotypical behavior and 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 some of the other less racially sensitive things that Jar Jar is or does, and it just it becomes a fucking bloody mess. <laughs> yeah. Um. So yeah, I do. I I wonder like what does people's reaction to Jar Jar mean to George Lucas? Um. But let's go ahead and get off Coruscant and let's go ahead and continue on with the story. You know, uh, well, no, no, let's stay on Coruscant for one more, one more part. We get our introduction to Django Fett. Uh, now, I personally don't give two shits about Boba Fett, and I'm I'm sorry for all the listeners out there if you're a big Boba Fett fan, but the dude meant nothing in the OT. Uh, he didn't. He didn't. It was a cool he looking was just guy. Cool wallpaper. Yeah, and, and good for toy sales. Definitely good for toy sales until somebody choked on the fucking missile and lawsuits. And isn't that the American dream to like sue somebody or something for millions of dollars and never have to work in your life? No. Um, Boba Fett was a toy <laughs> and he looks cool. Absolutely. But I never gave two shits about Boba Fett until reading some uh, expanded universe books. Well, that's what I was going to say. Was it that 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 maybe spawned his character and, and gave it more legs a little bit because people were interested in the character, mm -hmm. but he actually had some decent stories in the EU because they yes. went a lot more dark places, you know, bounty hunters doing bad shit, like they yeah. do. Um, and he was just this guy that jammed about the universe, getting into adventures and shit, wasn't he? Uh, <laughs> and it's, it, it was actually interesting, but... Uh I'll tell you one of my most favorite moments ever in the EU dealing with Boba Fett. There's a moment, and I cannot remember if it was the Killick Crisis, the New Jedi Order, Yuzon Vong Crisis, or uh, after that, uh, while Jason was going dark. Uh, but there's a moment that Han Solo has. I think it was the New Jedi Order. Uh, I honestly do. There's a moment where uh, Boba saves Han Solo. Mm -hmm. And there's a moment between Solo and Boba Fett, and Fett tells him, you were just a job. And I love mm. that moment. That moment speaks so much to the care and love and adoration that the EU uh, authors had. Because if you, if you strip away everything else and you just look at Boba Fett as a professional hitman and his – 
his hiring to take, you know, Han Solo out in Empire Strikes Back, it really was just a job. And it's not until we get into the prequel trilogy, specifically this film, that we learn about his, you know, why he should hate Jedi and Han Solo associates with the Jedi through Luke Skywalker. Mm. I love that line. You were just a job. But, Cam, Kyle, I would say that that doesn't really come from the movies. That comes from the EU having yes. created that in the first Absolutely. place. Because the EU, one of the aspects I did not like about the EU is the way that they made it this personal thing between well, Han Solo and shoes. Boba Fett. Um, because, obviously... It was as if there just became this thing between the two of them after that. And that, to me, was just trying to throw the two of them back together because they couldn't come up with something interesting on their own. I, would, I wouldn't have minded them coming across each other at time to time, but I didn't like that whole personal thing. So, yeah, I quite liked it when they ended that, to be honest. Yeah, you're, you were just a job. It wasn't anything personal. No, it shouldn't be. It was just, yeah. you know. He didn't have anything against Solo. He probably had worse bounty hunter things oh, God, go God. wrong, but it's just that one even ended up my Sarlacc. But if you go with EU, he got back out a couple of months later, so all cool, you know? Mm, yeah. Brian, um, what did you think about bringing Jango Fett into this? And, and um, yeah, what, what, do you, what do you think about Jango Fett being a part of this, this movie and this story? Jango Fett is not the issue. It's It's his connection to the clone wars mm-hmm. that's just so bizarre when you think about it um the i mean if you go like you said think back to the ot boba fett was just a guy he was just there you know he helped he worked with the uh, java fine if you knew back then that that how important that guy was to everything that has transpired to the rise of the empire you know to everything it Obviously, this was an afterthought, mm-hmm. and, and that you know, and that, and that's what it feels like an afterthought. That's a good way to, yeah, that's that's a good way. Let me ask you guys this, and we'll we'll start with Cam. Um, would you have preferred Django slash Boba to have nothing to do with the prequel trilogy, or are you are you happy that he is part of it, Cam? Do you know if they've done it better? then I wouldn't have had a problem with it at all. I, I don't think the connection was too bad, um, the whole kind of clone thing. Um, but it just just wasn't done well enough. But I, I, I've not got a major issue with it, I'll be honest. Okay. And uh, Brian, what do you think? Uh, at this point, it, it's fine. I mean, it is it is what it is. I, I And one of my favorite scenes is connected to Django in this film. So, okay. Yeah. Well, let's go ahead and get off Coruscant. Finally. Um, I do want to mention that, uh, the whole hit well, on Padme or oh, Cam, do you have something you specifically want to mention? Well, I just wanted to mention, obviously on Coruscant, I actually quite like the scene or parts of the scene with, with a car chase through the city. Okay. Go um, ahead. You know, when Obi, I don't like the argument they're having, uh, before, before they get, um, the, you know, the, Anakin comes in with a lightsaber, and then Obi Wan jumps out the window and grabs onto the droid. That's actually quite an exciting scene, you know. It <laughs> is. Given no, it, but that, there's nothing really wrong the, with that. The air speeder and everything. Yeah, I mean, actually, but the problem is, you can see that the storyboard did that out, and they've got the storyboard really good, but they haven't worked on the dialogue in between. <laughs> it's it's the perfect example of why the dialogue kills the scene. Because any time that Obi Wan and Anakin are talking, it just doesn't feel like there's any banter or chemistry be- yeah. between them. Once again, the other thing I hate about that scene is when they're going straight down towards the ship, and Obi Wan's getting all scared, and Anakin just starts doing that weird laugh, like ha 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 ha, and I'm like, I, I don't get. It. The more I watch it, the more that just feels really out of place to me. I don't, I don't know why. If anybody else felt that way, and then they chase after this changeling who never changes. So yeah. this changeling goes into a crowd of people and never once attempts to change and be anyone else. And how does, you know, how does Anakin would that not have been that, a that's what good she exam- is. Yeah, would that not have been a really good way to kind of show that you can't fool the Jedi, you know, that they, mm-hmm. could, they could sense who it was, but having her change into other people. Um, and also want to mention that 
you know, there was a missed opportunity, of course, when Obi-Wan, I think possibly my favourite line in the movie of Obi-Wan's is when he says, Anakin says, what are you going to do? Get a drink. And he just goes to the bar. I thought that was actually quite cool. But they missed an opportunity of Obi-Wan be a hardcore alcoholic, which uh, <laughs> I think a few fans talked about online afterwards. Yeah, yeah, that's what's going to be in Revenge of the Sith. We're going to find out that Obi-Wan's been hard, <laughs> hard on the booze this whole time. He was just, you know, he was going for a quick and pick me up. You know, you'll see shots of him picking a flask out the back of his pocket and stuff. But no, uh, in all seriousness, you know, that, that could have been just so much better. It's a storyboard that works, but, you know, make the change and do something, fix the dialogue, and you've actually got really quite a cool action scene there. Uh, before we carry on, Brian, do you have a response or anything to go uh, with that? Just that, yeah, I, I enjoy that sequence, but the another cringy line is towards the end of that when, uh, when Anakin's like, this is Jedi business. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's yeah. Like so bad. And, and it's like what like i don't think anybody cares like everybody's just sort of look at him like okay he's like go back to your well what is it go back to, go your, back drinks. to your drinks yeah. yep. jedi business jedi business Definitely. and look at his daughter and Ahmed best's there and anthony daniels is there so we had that little cameo he got all of them into a little scene where they were out of costume as well oh very good yeah, yeah. uh so let's let's go ahead and get off of coruscant and let's let's carry on uh to um to Naboo, you know, uh, it basically gets down to... Do we Obi-Wan. have to? Yeah, we have to. <laughs> uh, it basically gets down to uh, Obi-Wan's going to go ahead and investigate the uh, assassination attempts on uh, Amidala uh, through the planet Kamino, uh, because that's where they've kind of tracked. He goes to this diner, and I actually kind of like the diner scene, but he goes to this diner to get information about, you know, uh, where this this poison dart comes from. And he was like, oh, it's from the Caminos on Camino. And um, that's that's where we, we finally get the split. So Obi-Wan's going to go there, and then Anakin's going to take Padme, Amidala, back to Naboo to hide out. Uh, so the one place that everybody knows she's from is the place that they're going to go ahead and take her back to, which makes no sense. I mean, they'd been better taking her to Dantooine, Tatooine, Bespin. I mean, any any number of fucking planets to hide her. But no, let's let's take her back to her home planet. And we get our split. So Anakin and, and Amidala go off to Naboo and Obi-Wan goes off to Kamino. Let's talk about... Anakin and Padme. Anakin has from the from the get go been very creepy about Padme. I haven't seen her in ten years. I dream about her. I can't stop thinking about her. I love her, even though I'm not, you know, I don't have jack shit to talk about her. She's ten years older than me. All this, all this stuff. They really Lucas went out of his way to make Anakin seem creepy, stalker ish almost. But yet we're supposed to believe there's this 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 love affair between the two. And there's even – I want to mention this specifically. And there's a scene where uh, Padme tells Anakin not to look at me that way because it makes me uncomfortable. Uh, Brian, this, this dynamic between the two, the whole creepy Anakin to st- stalked uh, Padme, go ahead and take us through your thoughts of that. So him being into her makes sense. I get it. He knew, you know, when he was a little kid, he met her. She was pretty. Uh, you know, he's been thinking about her all these years. I get it. Yeah. Her in, getting into him doesn't make sense. They never do anything to earn that. It, it, yeah. it just doesn't. And like you said, he comes off very creepy. And she even points this out. And yet there is no, I, I guess, no, there really isn't a scene where, She's like, wow, you're really, you know, you're really cool. I'm into you. Like, it just doesn't, all all the stuff on Naboo is just weird, awkward, and sometimes creepy, especially, um, and I don't know, how, yet again, going back to the direction, the way he looks at her is creepy. Yeah, they got <laughs> it, that it, right. It really is. It, 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 it feels <clears throat> off, you know. Do you it, know what it feels like? And this is the truth. It feels like a scene at a Game of Thrones or something like that. Where someone has got affection for another character, but they're not interested. And later on, yes. they're going to capture them, force them to marry them, and take <laughs> take their lands and kill That's... all their, their brothers and fathers so that they, they can't say anything about it. 
you know, that's what it feels like, and yes. that's not what it's supposed to be, and, and that is probably the worst criticism I can give of it. That's a no, Cam. Yeah. You, you you brought up that's that's a very good point, a very good uh, analogy or metaphor or whatever you want to fucking call it. Um, absolutely. Um, that is the do Cam. Do you have anything else to expand on the the whole Naboo, Anakin, and Padme thing? Well, I mean, the sound of music scene is 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 tragic. It's, it's, it's laughable. You know, I can actually imagine that there may have been some people that got up and walked out at that point. That's how bad it is. So let me ask this. Uh, up to the point we're at right now in the film, uh, does anybody else's worst scene come after that? The sound of music scene that, that Cam was talking about. Anybody's worst scene come after that? Oh, it could be any on the boot. To be honest, it <laughs> yeah. really could be any of them. Because uh, I'll, so I'll bad, admit it, you know, uh, that's, that may take the biscuit. Yeah, yeah, that's that's one of our our uh, so to speak talking points for the the last call podcast that will go through all of these and that sound of music scene, the the scene there in frolicking in the field is is my idea of the worst scene in this movie. So so, so it's funny because it, yes. But it has one of my favorite dialogue. Go ahead, Brian. Parts. It's when they start talking politics, and it's a it's very brief. It's right before it's right before that. It's it's literally a minute, minute and a half when he's sort of discussing what he thinks uh, his vision of what the perfect political system is. Yeah, I wish that scene he acts well. You know, I, I like I like the way he said it because he said it in a very, you know, well they should be made to. You know, and then and she looks at him like, or what are you saying? And then he smiles and, you know, and then then the scene falls into, a, you know, a, a nightmare. But yeah, but but I like that one scene and I wish there was more of that. I'll, I, I'll tell you, sorry, just to kind of yeah. jump in on that. Um, I, I, I actually know how, how you'd make that work. I, I've thought about this long because the Naboo thing absolutely kills this film. As they were flying in the boo, they should have had other bounty hunters chase after them so that there was two exciting scenes going on at the same time. They have to, I don't know, jump ship, get into another ship, fly away, mm-hmm. and they've got people chasing them so that they're in constant peril. But the dialogue that's going through that would be discussing the differences that they have in the political you know, that would be part of the, the disagreement of them, but the whole you fall in love with people in peril because you save each other kind of thing ends up making them sort of fall in love with each other, even they, though they have these completely opposite ideals. That that yeah. would have worked as a, as a piece of drama, and you'd understand why they got together and why what happened happened, basically, in the end, which we all knew was going to happen at that point. Definitely. No, that's that's a uh, a good take on it. Uh, let's go over to Camino, and we discussed a little bit about Jango Fett. <laughs> so here we have Anakin, or excuse me, Obi Wan, separate from Anakin, and we get to see Ewan McGregor play Obi Wan Kenobi. Um, Cam, ha- going through the whole Camino scene from Obi Wan landing and and talking, I cannot remember the character's name. I apologize for this, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, but going from that to his, Torn we you talking about the Camino? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Go, going from that to his rainy encounter with uh, Jango Fett in uniform, and even his encounter with Jango Fett in in his room. Uh, mm-hmm. Go ahead and walk us through your take on that. I actually really like it. I, I think you could take that out, put it in a different movie, and no one would really say too much about it. You know, to be honest with you, I don't really see much wrong with it. Um, Obi Wan is being the investigator. It's you know he's he's investigating what's happening. You have this whole reveal of the clones, and that's quite exciting because you're like, oh, the clones are stormtroopers. This is coming together. <laughs> we get the clones were stormtroopers. Fuck, you know this is making sense now. What's going on here? And actually, that I mean that's the plot of the movie right there that's happening. Um, and and I think actually that's that's really good. And I actually like the fight with. Obi Wan and Django in the rain because I, I just I said this in a, a, the previous podcast I do kind of like lightsaber battles in strange places that that kind of appeals to me somehow um, so I like the whole rain and the lightsaber fight um, and and Django getting tied up it was actually quite a cool action scene I like Slave One so seeing that sort of blast off away at the end there it was was pretty cool as well um, I really don't have much of an issue with that part at all. 
Okay. Uh, Brian, your take on it. Uh, agreed. Uh, and th- earlier when I was talking about how his acting was fine, I felt when he wasn't around Hayden Christensen, that's a great sequence. Um, I like his back and forth with Django. I, I like him, you know, com- you know, talking with the Camino Caminoans or whatever, however you would uh, refer to them. <laughs> um, Camino, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I, don't know. Uh, whatever. I like I like the look of the planet or the water. I like the, yeah. the, their tech. I like uh, yeah. I like the rain. I like the battle. Um, you know, why haven't we seen fucking Mon Calamari? Why? Why? <laughs> Talk about fucking water <laughs> planets. God yeah. damn it would it. be cool. It is a planet I would have liked to, to see them go to in a Star Wars um, film before. Um, it didn't need to be in the prequels, but yeah, no, yeah. it would have been cool because I did like uh, that whole kind of, yeah, it's totally rain. Any, water anything cool. else, Brian? Uh, yeah, I, like I said, I, I really enjoyed the uh, the battle. Good. Uh, um, so obi-wan follows Django off to geonosis and and let's you know we can't we can't escape uh the fact that anakin leaves naboo to go to tatooine to rescue his mother so for the first time in 10 fucking years he (laughs) decides to uh stow away or steal away or whatever you want to say away uh to go save his mother we we get to tatooine we see an even more Jewish stereotype and Watto with the beard and everything, and even a hat that that both looks like a yarmulke or um, there's another name for it. Uh, I can't. I don't want to mess it up. I don't want to say it wrong, but it's got an L E sound at the end of it. Your Merkel or something like that. I apologize. Uh, but he's got this this hat, this helmet that looks both like that and a World War One Doughboy's <laughs> helmet at the same time. Uh, but yeah, Watto definitely a stereotype. Horrible. Ju- uh, Jesus, Lucas, what the hell were you thinking? Anyways, Lani. Lani? <laughs> We we get that we get this whole scene with Anakin, you know, rushing off to go save his mom. I buy that he uses the Force to seek her out, but I just don't buy why it took him this long to steal away to do it. Um, do you guys got any In, pertinent uh, comments on that? It's her being tortured, which we do see evidence of Vader then using this in Empire to draw look to him. When someone's being tortured, they're, you know, they're suffering, that those emotions can carry a lot of weight with anyone that you've got an attachment to. So I actually completely buy that um, that was what was prompting those visions from mm-hmm. him that he mentions even at the start of the film to Obi-Wan. And it yeah. just built up to that point where she was, she was on her last legs and, and it, it just became so much that you had to go so okay so you don't you, you're you're okay with him never having gone after her before because it was a recent fairly recent kidnapping yes she was happy okay. so he didn't have any strong emotions about it and the jedi Actually, would have, i'm assuming think of it that way. i'm assuming the jedi would have not wanted him to go back because yeah he tried to break that connection with his mother as well so uh, brian any any takes on that so oddly enough uh, and I, I didn't think about it until this most recent viewing. I think Hayden Christensen's best material is the Tatooine stuff. I think that his interaction with Watto in particular, yeah. he does some facial yeah. things where he's looking at him and Watto gets intimidated. He actually like, acts. He acts, exactly. <laughs> um, the Yeah, I, I actually think that's some of the best stuff. I, matter of fact, I think in the entire film, that's his best scenes. Um, nice. I actually have a theory. I think Hayden Christensen can do angry, but he can't do anything else. Because all, <laughs> all these angry stuff he actually pulls off pretty well. Yes. He looks ferocious in Revenge of the Sith as well when he when he turns, but maybe that's why they cast him because they could because he could do that and they thought, oh, he'll just be able to do the other stuff, so that's fine. But you know, maybe Can you act I, angry? I, Give us angry. <laughs> I know, and you know, I kind of feel that, but maybe that's because the dialogue fits better at the angry parts because Lucas was better at writing those parts. What Lucas isn't good at doing is normal relationships, it seems. Mm -hmm. You know, that kind of banter between people, he just doesn't understand it, but but he can do the more grand operatic villainy stuff, if if that makes sense, Um, which which fit more with with the, the dialogue that he wrote. Yeah. I can see that, definitely. So let's bring everybody back together. We get to, uh, you know, uh, uh, Django Fett and his son, who turns out to be Boba Fett. We learn that. Uh, escape off to go to Geonosis. I don't, I, I really, I just watched the film and I still don't know why they decided to go 
there. Like, of all the places they could have gone, they decide to go there where uh, Count Dooku uh, is uh, Darth Tyrannus. And god damn, how fucking horrible are all the Darth names in the prequel trilogy? Tyrannus. Sidious. I mean, it's Maul. Yeah. What the... Whatever. Tyrannus is the one I hate the most. But I'm yeah. I'm one of those people that I I am I'm I'm completely 100 percent biased. If you guys read the Cantina, you know I mention the EU all the time, and I know the EU is not canon, but it still inspires a lot of stuff that comes from the new Disney canon, and it used to be canon. And I fucking love the EU, and there's a lot of things that the EU did that, despite the prequels, you know, you're talking shit like all. Bad guys use red light lightsabers and red means bad. Midichlorians and shit like fucking stupid names like Tyrannus and Sidious and Maul. Uh, all of that shit was made fun of in the EU. I love that. But uh, let, let's get to let's get to Geonosis and and we've got Tyrannus there. We we get some more politics, which Brian says is the best part of this movie. <laughs> and and we get uh, you know. Uh, uh, Dooku creating these uh, alliances and hey, I'll promise you this if you do that. We we know there's a new battle droid army coming up. Uh, Brian, go ahead and walk us through your take on Geonosis. Uh, in my opinion, Christopher Lee is is my favorite thing about this movie. Period. Okay. Um, and and I I love I'm a big. Full disclosure, I love all the old Hammer films. I love pretty much everything uh, he's been in. And so I think he takes this role and he plays it so seriously. Every Matter of fact, every scene that he speaks, I feel, um, ele- is elevated because he's in it. I think his, his interaction with Obi-Wan is, is strong. You know, he Because he, it feels like he takes the material seriously. Even though it's insane, some of the stuff he has to say, he, he takes it very seriously, his approach. And and I and I enjoy that. So that part I love. Now, as far as story, there's a lot of issues with Geonosis, in my opinion. Um, as far as I, I know, it's it's nitpicky stuff, but like just the I mean, I'm jumping ahead. I don't want to jump ahead, but the the sequence of people arriving. Okay, the Jedi arrive, and then the clone troopers arrive. Nobody has any kind of scanners or. Mm-hmm. You know, nobody saw any of this coming in. Everybody just swooped in. You know, I don't know. There's a lot of weird story things that happens on Geonosis, but I think the the problem is that they should have they should have made it more clear that Sidious's plan was to bring the Jedi there in the first place, mm-hmm. and, and and telegraph that through Dooku, obviously orchestrating that he's wanting to bring the Jedi in. He wants the clones to attack. The whole purpose was to start a war. That's the whole point yeah. of it. You know, so Django Fett should have been summoned to Geonosis um by the fact that they knew Obi-Wan had got hold of him. You know, you could have seen Ton Wee make a little phone call to someone you don't know who it is. Next minute Django Fett gets told Head to Geonosis now. Yeah. Oh, we need to go this way. Boom. Obi Wan yeah. follows. Them. Like I said, why did he go there? Of all the yeah. places he could have gone, he was the way the movie made it seem. He's just trying to get away from Obi Wan, but he goes to the fucking yeah. center of the conspiracy. Yeah, that's why yeah. I said there's a lot of story problems when you when you when you really get around Geonosis. Yeah. Um. But definitely. So let's talk about and Cam I'll let you go ahead and uh walk us through this. Let's talk about what I think is the best scene <laughs> in the movie and that is the Geonosis fight uh from from the beginning of of uh uh the uh Anakin and and uh Obi-Wan escaping with with Padme to the Jedi showing up through the attack of the clones. Ooh, you like how they worked that 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 title into the actual story? <laughs> go ahead, Cam. Okay, so first of all, the droid factory scene was was awful, and actually added in later. Um, <laughs> they didn't film that at first. They went back and decided that they needed something in between. They and needed they created C3PO this and R two D two, yeah. and and they decided to create this whole scene after they had already shot the rest of the film. It was an afterthought, and and they shouldn't have. But anyway, once we get into the fight, obviously you've got the Jedi fight the beasts at first, which is 
Mm-hmm. That was a bit boring. I don't I didn't really like that, to be honest. Um, you know, I know he likes to always get a monster in each film, but um, I really didn't particularly enjoy that aspect of things. Uh, but once the Jedi arrive and they all start fighting the battle droids, I think that's quite exciting. Mm-hmm. Um, I think Samuel L. Jackson looks terrible fighting with a lightsaber. They never, <laughs> they never trained him enough. Um, and in any film, I thought he looked the, the worst at using his lightsaber believably um, in, in any of the fights he was in. Um, so I didn't like that aspect of things. And obviously, I did like when the clones arrive, uh, when Yoda turns up, you know. Around the survivors, a perimeter create. God, yeah, God so. damn it, Cam. Just, I need you to do like 10 minutes of voice good. impersonations <laughs> for LRMonline.com. Does, can you get on that? <laughs> yeah, yeah, no worries. I'll get right on it. Go ahead, bud. <laughs> um, and, you know, that's quite exciting. I liked it. The, 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 the fight scenes were quite cool. There was some cool shots where I remember one. Uh, there was one shot that I remember always liking, and it, it didn't hold up as well now, but where there's, like, dust, and you see the clone troopers, like, fighting through, but you can't quite see who they're fighting against because of all the dust that's kicking up. You just see the laser blasts kind of flying across. I thought that was actually quite well done. Um, and I suppose we're going to talk about the finale sort of slightly after, yeah. the next part after, so I'll leave it there. But I actually don't... I didn't like the monsters. I didn't like the droid factory. The other part, yeah, if they'd have just got to that quicker, I'd have been happier. Brian, any other takes on a tattoo... Or not tattooing, Geonosis, before we go ahead and continue on to the finale? Pretty much the same. I, I enjoyed the arena stuff. I, I like, you know, the gold gladiator thing. I, I like, you know, like John Carter of Mars. And I like a lot mm-hmm. of that old pulpy sci-fi stuff. And, and that all does that. I also love military sci-fi. So the battle scene, I actually enjoyed the battle scene more last night than I previously remember enjoying. Mm. Um, mm. I, yeah, I thought that was really cool. Uh, now it's the Mace Windu stuff. I, I see what you're saying. If you If you look at the way that was cut, the, the way that was edited, you could tell they were editing around him. Yeah. Um, yeah, you can actually you, you can actually tell that. When you when you think about I don't think they gave him because he had a very non action part though, he didn't do as mm. much training with a lightsaber as a like so Ewan yeah. McGregor and Hayden oh. Christensen, they were going to weeks of training and I think mm-hmm. Samuel L. Jackson's like, you know, hey motherfucker, I ain't doing that. You know <laughs> <Yeah>. what I mean? <laughs> I, <laughs> they knew who the fuck I am, that. god damn it. <laughs> Now, it always, it's just a weird thought, but it always bothered me that when uh, Bobo lifts up Django's helmet, his head doesn't fall out. Oh, God, yeah. <laughs> just, it's so, I mean, to think the head's just really well wedged in there. Someone needs to actually redo that as a meme um, in this day and age. That could be done. That would be hilarious. Good God. Yeah. That, that, that is, look, I, it, to me, it's, it's one of the best scenes of the entire movie. I love seeing all the Jedi. And I actually remember, this is going back a long, long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. Uh, but I remember the first fan-made trailer for Attack of the Clones where they were using stuff from Braveheart and Photoshopping fucking lightsabers and shit into it. And it's amazing how close that, that, that fan-made trailer was to what actually happened in the movies as far as that type of scene with a bunch of Jedi attacking, you know, other beings. Mm. Um, I, I, did you guys ever see that? Yeah, that's, yeah. yeah. Um, at the time, I, did, I remember seeing it. Yeah, it was, that's it was a long right. fucking time ago. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but better I find I, made trailers these days, but that's because yeah. the technology's better these days even oh, yeah. for us schmucks in the house. <laughs> I do appreciate it, and I, I agree with a lot of what you guys had to say. You know, it's it's kind of like the penultimate scene, or I don't know if penultimate's the right word, but it's it's the ultimate scene for this movie, and everything kind of ends there. I do want to say this, though. When we get to the Jedi fighting Dooku, when we get to Anakin, Obi-Wan, and of course, Yoda fighting Dooku, I hated that. I hate it. Like, as, even as an EU guy where I know you can use the force to shunt away pain, where you can use the force to give yourself energy and strength that you don't have, I absolutely hated the CGI fest that was Yoda versus Dooku. Brian, what did you think of that? Um, I remember thinking it was pointless even back when it came out, mm-hmm. but, but I never really hated it. 
Um, I hated it. The past. I, 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 the thing that I hate most now watching it is all the CG they did with Christopher Lee. Like, it's it looked he himself. You can tell that you know they had to um, that it was a body double. Mm-hmm. It's it stands out a lot, and I don't um, like the, the man was in his seventies at that point. True, though. true, yeah. absolutely. I I agree, and which is why I think. They could have went, and you know, obviously Lucas wanted a big action set piece, but I think they should have went with more of a wizard versus wizard duel, which they sort of do, and then they're like, oh, we have to, you know, resort to our lightsabers. Well, I don't think they necessarily needed to do that. Uh, I, lightsabers. I completely agree. Um, I actually, I really thought one of the, as those fan nerdy questions I always wondered was how would Yoda have dealt with the lightning that the Emperor throws at Luke? And I love that we got the answer to that question as Yoda just, you know, grabs it in his hand, pings it back. Much to learn, you still have. You know, it's, it's, I'm like, God damn it, Kim, I yes, love you. Fucking hell, Yoda, he does have a lot to learn. You tell him, son. You know, and that's, the, you know, what I was thinking at that point. But the lightsaber fight, uh, I think they should have kept that for Revenge of the Sith and worked on it a little bit more because it just, yeah, I agree. It, it didn't work as well and I would have preferred to see a wizard duel. Definitely. So you know, at the end of the, at the end, unlike Empire Strikes Back, which was the middle movie of the original trilogy, and this one, we pretty much end on a high note. The good guys win. Yeah, they're developing the Death Star, but whatever the fuck. Pretty much the good guys win in this. Yeah, Dooku gets away, but still, overall, yeah. you know, it's- they do make that they do to make that connection. And don't get me wrong, it's not that there's no loss. Whatsoever, they do make that connection with uh, Anakin losing an arm uh, to Luke losing his hand in Empire Strikes Back. But I, I feel that Attack of the Clones ends on a higher note, maybe even inadvertently, than Empire Strikes Back does. Brian, do you think it ends on a higher note than it, it should have? I mean, it, yeah, it ends with a wedding. I mean, yeah, it, it um. I really love that shot of, you know, the, you know, the Imperial sequence, you know, I love that shot. And then it cuts to the wedding. I, 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 we haven't talked about this, but I quite enjoy the score for this film. Okay. Yeah. Sure do I. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, uh, I think it's, it's better than it deserves to be. It's, it's a great, uh, the Padme Anakin sort of love theme is really good. It's way better than the actual love in the film. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I, I I see what you mean as far as the way it ended. Uh, it didn't end with a blow, you know, like a yeah, main, yeah. Okay, not, well, I'm not gonna... as bad as as Luke. No, I am your father from yeah. Empire Strikes Back. No, no. I'm going to completely disagree with you, sir, because this no, you're is fired. Actually, no, no, this is actually you're my. <laughs> Go ahead. This is actually my favourite scene in the film, and I actually believe that the ending from from Yoda talking to Obi Wan, where he says, "You know, I'll do the voice again, cause why not?" You know, Master Obi Wan, not victory. The shroud of the dark side has fallen, begun. The Clone War has, and it, and then it just um. And then it goes into this montage musical score. I actually think it's one of the best scenes in all of Star Wars from that wow. point out. Oh. Because you you pump into the Imperial March, you know, do, 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 which is the first time we've really heard that going in the prequel trilogy to this point. As you see the the massive clone army loading up onto the ships and the Senator, you know, Chancellor Palpatine, sorry, standing there with a little glint in his eye and you see Bail Organa you know, he, he kind of puts his head down because he, because he knows that this is not good. You know, this is this is a tragic road that we've went down here. And and then it cuts to, obviously, Padma, Mari and Anakin, which we know they've already explained to us yeah. that to do this in secret is going to be a bad thing. So it's actually a tragic ending because everything's went to shit. The... the, the Senator, the Chancellor Palpatine's got exactly what he wanted. He's got a clone army under his control, and he's ignited a war, uh, the whole galaxy, which is going to pretty much wipe out the Jedi. And the the Trump card of the good guys has fallen down the dark side and, and went way away off in his own to get married to someone in secret, which is not the worst thing in the world, but the way that the Jedi deal with relationships 
pushes it into that, which is part of why the Jedi need to change the way they, they think about things. Um, so I actually think it's a really tragic ending, and it's oh. absolutely my favourite scene so, in so the So what film. you're saying is is you disagree with the host and you're fired. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, actually, you know, you no, can't the fire way, me. no the, like legitimately, the way that you just explained it is an incredibly great way to take a look at it, and it does make me think about it. It ah, from that point of view, it does end on a on a pretty much downer note. I was kind of looking at it more superficially, I guess. Uh, but way to go, I, I Cam. That's. But I think that's the problem, and I don't disagree with anything you said. But it forces the audience to make all those connections, which isn't Look necessarily paper. a. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, the which which supposed to have been about to get to the whole film's purpose is to get us to that point at that yeah. that final montage. That's that's the entire purpose of Attack it, of the Clones. Now they don't do it well to get yes. there, but it doesn't excuse that if you to take that scene out and put it at the end of a much better film that we then sit and create and chop up and and make a much better film with better dialogue, better scenes in it, and then you just shove that scene onto the end, you wouldn't notice. You know, because there's nothing wrong with it. Yeah, Yeah. definitely. God damn it, Cam. Shit. (laughs) (laughs) No, absolutely. Cool. So let's go ahead and uh, wrap up the last couple parts of our talking points. Uh, Cam, who do you think was the strongest actor and the weakest actor for this movie? Okay, so I I have to agree with Brian that it has to be Christopher Lee. I mean, the man is immense. He's so good in anything he ever does. However... I don't think it's his best role by a long way, and I think he is also struggling with the dialogue, and he was used not enough in the film. He he comes into it too late. He should have been in the movie far earlier, I think. Um, But, yeah, he's probably the best uh, one, I think. And and your weakest? Oh, come on. It's Amadala, (laughs) Natalie Portman, again. Really? Okay. Like a cardboard cutout. You know, throughout the film, um, she doesn't look engaged. She has zero chemistry with Hayden Christensen as well. Um, and I'm assuming by really, you're going to go with Hayden here. Um, I'm just guessing. Maybe. But um, but I actually think she she just doesn't do it. She never gets better. I would expect it more from her having been in the first one, you know, to have progressed that, to take that kind of savory. Where's this see, character going me next? Second guess myself. You but, ass. It's also, it's, it's what Lucas does with her, though. Because, yeah. again, we talked about, you've got this creepy Anakin, which must be the way Lucas t- tells this guy to play the, the role. Mm-hmm. You know, it must, must come from the election. Yeah, look as if you're, you know, or something like that here. Uh, but she just doesn't do anything to make you think why she is falling for Anakin. She, she shows no emotion at all. And when Anakin goes in for the kiss, if you actually look at that, you think, well, she's actually going to pull away here. There is no... Biddy that who, without knowing what was going to come next, could watch that scene and think she's not going to pull away here because yeah. there's no reason for her to go in for the kiss. No, not there's not. Whatsoever. She just doesn't show in. She's just looking at him. Yeah, definitely. Uh, Brian, your strongest and your weakest actor for this movie? Uh, Christopher Lee, strongest. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And um, for all the reasons I said earlier, and as far as weakest, uh, I, I went with Hayden Christensen. And the re- I, I do agree that her performance does not grow at all and that she, the cardboard description is solid. But Hayden Christensen, unfortunately, this film was sort of on his shoulders. Mm-hmm. And and the weight of it just came, came crashing down. <laughs> and so, and so I, I, I do feel... That's fair. Yeah, yeah, yeah and, that, and that's the only reason. But no, I, I agree. I think after Phantom Menace came out, she did not want to be a part of any of this. Yeah. And it shows, and it, it does show, where I feel he... Well, in the next film, I think he tries a little more. <laughs> I do, where she doesn't. But in this particular film, because he's so instrumental to the film, Hayden Christensen, I believe, is the worst. Yeah, I'm I'm going to dif- differentiate with you guys on uh, the be- the strongest. I think you McGregor really did a great job with everything that he was given. I'm not denying that Christopher Lee did a good job. He absolutely did. Uh, I'm just kind of looking at kind of like what Brian said, weight of the movie. And yeah. I think you and McGregor really, really tried harder than anybody else. I mean, I, he's I, a lead actor. Yeah. He was the best of the lead yeah. actors. Uh, I, I, I feel Agreed. like that. 
So I'm I'm going to say Ewan McGregor was the strongest. While I'm going to agree with Brian that uh, he and and it's not a knock against you whatsoever, Cam, because she would be a very close second. But I'm I'm going to say Hayden's the 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 weakest actor, because unlike Padme, who has one story to really carry, Hayden had two. He had yeah. Obi Wan and Padme to carry, and he couldn't carry either one of them. Um. So I found yeah. I found Hayden Christensen to be the 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 weakest actor. Uh, Brian, your best scene for this movie. So there's two scenes that I. No, uh, you only get I, one. I, 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 no, you <laughs> can have it. It's all right. There, there's fired, two. Okay. Um, uh, the asteroid space battle. Okay. I, I just really like that scene. I don't, I don't know. As far it's it's unique. It's fun. I quite enjoyed it, and I like the Christopher Lee Obi Wan scene. Okay. Uh, that's uh, a good scene. Yeah. I really like as far as scenes of just dialogue, two guys talking. I think that's one of the best in the entire film. Okay. And, well, can uh, I just yeah. point something oh. out though about oh, that scene in particular? And many scenes we Obi Wan though the wig. The wig doesn't look good in Attack of Clones. Compare him to how he looks in Revenge of the Sith. Uh, I don't think they had him grow a beard properly at some point for parts of Attack of the Clones. So he was wearing like a wig beard and yes. had this like long wig on. I hate that, you know, it's it's nothing against what he does, but the, the look they gave him in Attack of the Clones is horrible. <laughs> so what anyway. is your, your best scene? Well, you I've already told you, um, my best scene is the, the final scene, um, the montage at the end, okay. 100%. Uh, for me, it's simple. It's it's the the Coliseum. It's the arena. I really really enjoyed that. Uh, the Nexu and and all. I uh, it's an incredibly fun scene. It's high action, despite some of the cringy lines that come with it. It's one of the first moments after the. And I know Camino has that one small action scene with with Obi Wan and Django, but since the. Um, the scene with the assassination and the airspeeder and droid chase, Geonosis's uh, arena scene for me is like the best action set piece for it. Uh, Cam, what is the worst scene in this movie? Yeah, I've got to go with uh, sound of music. Um, despite I do, I do get absolutely what Brian was saying about the little tiny snippet of dialogue in there, mm-hmm. uh, but really it could be anything on the boo. You know, everything that happens in the boo is, is quite tragic, really. Now, uh, Brian, fireplace scene. Um, I, I hate the lighting, I hate the costumes, I hate the dialogue. Um, actually, let me see if I can find it. I wrote one of the lines, it was so bad. Um, I don't know if I can find it. Uh, anyways, it, it, it's it's like them, it's like Anakin's trying to read bad poetry i mean yeah a bad bad you, you know it's you know it's great speaking of that scene i'm always reminded even watching it this time of the robot chicken uh, star wars sketch where she's she's freaking like i i'm going to be attracted to you but i'm not going to do anything with you and yes. i'm going to tease you but i'm not going to do anything and then she does the flash dance pour water yeah. over herself and it, that's, it, here, here's the line I'm haunted by the kiss you never should have given me yeah. <laughs> it's so bad I mean it, and it, and that wasn't the only bad line I mean it just kept going and going and going and oh, yeah, I, hate, I hated that scene I even hated the way just look at the way the scene is framed even the when she gets up and the way she moves mm-hmm. and the camera moves I hate the whole I hate it I hate that scene it's oh. it's rough I, you know, I agree I'm ahead, actually, do you know what you've convinced me bro I'm <laughs> going to change my mind <laughs> I, I was teetering between the two. You've sold yeah. me. Uh, that it's... is worse because there there is some semblance. Uh, oh, there's the horrible part of the sound of music scene, but there is a little part of it that's slightly better than that. And whereas in the fireplace scene, there's not one redeeming quality yeah. I can find in there. Well, because I don't want to give Brian a big head, I'm going to stick with my convictions and say the sound of music scene. <laughs> I do, I do. No, Brian's got a, a valid point, and uh, Cam, you're you're a weak individual for changing. No, I'm joking. <laughs> um, I I do hate the the frolicking scene. It's the the campiness of the of the love and the the romance. Just it it grates on me in a way that almost nothing else in the prequels does. Like I personally, I can almost believe 
even though the delivery is bad, but I can almost believe the fireplace scene. And I do agree with Brian and, and I guess Cam, since he has no convictions, uh, that, <laughs> that the cut of the film or uh, the cut of that scene is not that great. But uh, yeah, for me, it's, it's going to remain. And I wrote it down as frolicking in the field. Uh, Brian, what change would you make for this movie to make it better? You know, I thought about that and, and it, there's too many as far as story it's just it would take an hour to just <laughs> so you know what i mean and because the yeah. way it's connected to the next film so so basically to simplify it it needed another person to look at the script and rewrite a bunch of the dialogue okay. uh and, and that's the easiest way to say it i mean the yeah. di- it's the dialogue that that's that really hurts this film and cam yeah, I mean, I've, I've given a few ideas as we've talked through this and various things, but for me, I agree with Brian. The basic plot of the movie is fine. They need to improve the dialogue throughout. It needed to be written again by someone else. They had to change the relationship between Obi-Wan and Anakin to something more believable and then just take out Naboo completely mm-hmm. and put something else in that gets them to Tatooine. You know, some other um, mechanic where they can have some action, some peril, and and some way to build a relationship between the two. Um, Other than that, it really is just dialogue and pacing. Very good. I'm a lot with you, Cam, 100%, uh, and and Brian, because dialogue just in this movie, there seems to be a running, you know, fucking theme in these last two movies. Uh, The dialogue just sucks. So George Lucas, stop fucking writing and let some, you know, come up with the story (laughs) and let somebody else fucking write it. Yeah. Um, yeah. that covers it, ladies and gentlemen. We made it through episode two, <laughs> Attack of the Clones, so you don't have to watch it ever again, ever, 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 ever again. Uh, let me ask this: this honestly, Brian, unless somebody was like doing something like this with you, will you ever watch episode two again of your uh, own free will? Because Rogue One exists, no. Very good. And Cam, what about you? Will you, <laughs> without a reason to, would you ever pop this movie in again? No, probably not. Um, I hadn't watched this in maybe a good, I want to say, seven or eight years since my son was very young, uh, and we watched it together. Um, and I, I just, I can't see me ever watching it again unless I had to for some reason. As Definitely you say. good. It's been a, it's been around since the release of Revenge of the Sith. Since the last time I watched this, Brian, when was the last time you watched this movie? Besides, you know, when uh, you saw it in theaters, twenty fifteen, right before Force Awakens came out. Hmm. Did you do a marathon or something? Yes, I marathoned one through six. You're a brave man. <laughs> You're a brave man. Well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for tuning in to the Last Call podcast. Please make sure you do subscribe and share with your friends and family. Make sure you guys check out all the great stuff we have uh, at lrmonline.com, your your entertainment news and opinion source. I mean, we got such amazing writers. Go ahead and check us out. Make us your homepage. If we're not your homepage, you are wrong. No. Uh, also, check out our YouTube page. We have amazing celebrity interviews from Gig. He does an amazing job getting A-class celebrities to spill the beans on their projects. Uh, be sure to check out the greatest show on LRM Online, uh, which is LRM Ranks It. Uh, if you guys checked out this week's episode, you know we've got a new format. Let us know how you think about that. Subscribe. Hit that bell. Share us with friends and family. You guys know what to do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for being fans of LRM Online. Uh, Cam, where can people find you at online? Yeah, you can catch me. Uh, my email address is cam at lrmonline.com. You'll normally find me writing news stories during the week. Um, and most of the time, I'll probably be chatting with any of our readers on the stories about the specific points themselves. And you can catch me on Twitter as well. Although I'm not on there very much. Okay, and Brian, I know you have uh, some stuff that you've done in the past that you're looking to bring back. Uh, where can people find you at? Uh, just on YouTube. Uh, my channel is Pulp Mythos. And uh, yeah. Very good. <laughs> <laughs> check That's, it out. Brian's yeah, Brian's out. got great opinions. I mean, I am slightly biased. I've known the guy since 2000, but you know, whatever. Uh, you guys can find me at that Kyle Malone on Twitter. 
Of course, I write the Cantina every Thursday at LRMOnline.com, as well as the primary host of LRM Ranks, even though uh, Nick Dahl likes to kind of, you know, work his way into uh, the scene for a couple of things. It's all good. <laughs> uh, make sure you guys are liking and sharing and subscribing. I can't say that enough. We survive off of you guys, and we appreciate every time one of you guys leaves a comment. So let us know what you think about Attack of the Clones, what you think what you feel and think about Brian or Cam or myself and our opinions on this take. Thank you guys so much. Look forward to next month where we're going to be talking about none other than revenge of the Sith. It's going to be coming out uh, sometime. What, what did I write down? I think uh, like the 25th or something like that. Yeah. Whatever is the weekend after the 20 or the Thursday after the 20th, look out for revenge of the Sith. Uh, we're supposed to be doing that with our very own Fox Troilo. He's a great guy. He's our primary uh, film critic. I look forward to hearing from you guys. I look forward to comments and responding to them. Thank you so much. And, of course, may the Force be with you.